Welcome to Machine Minds, where technology and humanity meet. I'm your host, Greg Tarusian, founder of Samson Rose, a recruiting and search business focused on the robotics and AI industries. The Machine Minds show is where we dive deep into the intricate world of robotics and artificial intelligence. As a staffing industry leader with a passion for the frontiers of technology, I'm pleased to be bringing you intimate conversations with the founders, investors, and trailblazers who are at the heart of the AI and robotics revolution. In each episode, we dig into their journeys, the applications of the products they're working on, and the breakthroughs that are shaping our future. Join us as we explore how these machine minds are transforming the way we live, work, and understand our world. Whether you're an entrepreneur, a tech enthusiast, or just curious about this amazing field, you'll learn something new with each episode. Let's delve into the extraordinary. Let's delve into machine minds. Hello and welcome to Machine Minds. I'm your host, Greg Trusian, founder of Samson Rose, your robotics talent search partner. And on today's episode, I'm joined by Oliver Mitchell, partner at FF Cap Venture Capital. Thanks for being on the show today, Oliver. Thank you, Greg. This is awesome. Yeah, I'm glad we got this scheduled. Let's jump into it. So I look forward to it. Yeah, yeah. I'm 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 actually very excited to get your perspective on a lot of things and also for the listeners to hear more about your background because since we scheduled the show, I've obviously had the pleasure of doing a bit of research and we talked previously offline about some of the stuff that you've done and really interesting career path. And yeah, I think it's a very unique perspective. Um, just for the listeners and so we can kind of set the stage, can we start from the beginning and you tell us a bit about like your early career and what in initially drew you into the technology industry? Absolutely. Uh, I started my career as a startup founder. I built companies and sold them to big multinational organizations like a financial services company. And 32 months later, I sold it to American Express. Uh, I was involved in a um, turnaround of a publicly traded company from the London Stock Exchange to the uh, NASDAQ called Homes Protection. And with about three and a half years, uh, we sold that. Uh, to Tyco, which later became part of ADT and Johnson Controls. Um, I've been involved in digital media companies, uh, working with some of the largest me uh, media companies out there, uh, like HBO, Showtime, uh, E! Online, the Home Shopping Network. And um, after my last startup, which was in the STEM robotics space called Robot Galaxy, it had a retail component. It had an online multiplayer world, and it also had a comic book line. Um, I started to take a deep dive into the industrial robotics space. And I saw that no one was looking at robotics in 2011 from a business perspective. All the articles were about the beautiful servos and the cabling and the actuation. But I was looking at it like, what's the business model? What's the product market fit? How is this going to change industry? And uh, that got me in front of some amazing founders. And I started to say, listen, do you need a little bit of capital? And they said, yes. And I said, that's great. Here, here you go. And I created an investment vehicle called Otami Ventures. I built up a portfolio of more than a dozen companies. From that, I had about eight exits. Two of those companies went public, uh, and one got bought out by a private equity company for one point four billion dollars. Uh, so it worked out really well. Uh, I had to a, say the least. Uh, yeah, my wife's like, "Okay, let's start the home renovations," and <laughs> um, and then I started getting involved in the, in funds, and uh, I became very close to the partners at FF Venture Capital, where I'm at today, uh, with uh, John Frankel and Alex Katz. And as they made more investments in the automation sector, I became more hands-on. And today I sit on seven boards, either as a director or an observer. Some of those companies are like Cambrian Robotics, which is the computer vision, smart manufacturing space around cobots. Civ Robotics, which is in uh, construction and solar around autonomous layout and surveying. Uh, Plus One Robotics, uh, which is in logistics, um, among others. And, um, you know, I'm amazed about how far the industry has come. And just this year with Gen AI and the interest in humanoids, it's a, it's incredible because people yeah. used to look at me and walk around my hand and be like, hey, there's Oliver. He's a, he's a robot guy. You know, now <laughs> everybody's a robot guy. So it's awesome. Yeah. It's so cool. Yeah, it's a really, really exciting time for sure. 
Uh, so it sounds like it was kind of organic or I don't want to say by accident, but that you got into investment, like you just found the opportunity and then decided like, Hey, I could kind of advise, but give you capital as well. Or was that a goal for you? Did you want to get into the investment and venture capital world? Yeah. So I've been investing for quite some time. Uh, you know, going back to my, my founder days, mm-hmm. I've been an angel investor. I was a member of New York Angels. Mm-hmm. So it was always, you know, to build up a portfolio. I've worked with a lot of Israeli companies in helping them establish their business development operations here in the U.S. because Israel's a small country. There's not really a big market. Mm-hmm. So they either go to Europe or they come to the United States. And so, you know, I saw opportunities. Yeah, it was serendipitous. But um, I knew how to advise these companies in helping them, you know, get their product market fit, helping them get high utilization, helping them create a value proposition that accentuated their 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 payback in a reasonable time. You know, th- that really helped move that needle forward. Interesting. Okay, cool. And were there any big challenges or specific ones that come to mind that from when you made that pivot fully into the VC space uh, that you can share? Um, yeah, I would say that, you know, I think there's two, uh, challenges. One is, you know, um, sometimes the market is not ready for the, uh, innovation and you get really excited by the innovation. And so I've learned to really listen to the market. Um, you know, one company that I invested in out of my angel portfolio, Q Innovations. And I was really attracted to them based upon their mission. They developed robotic balls for cognitive behavior therapy for children with autism, right. and especially low functioning children. And, you know, it, it, you know, made me feel good about making that investment. But, you know, the therapeutic environment is very disenfranchised and there's not a DME code and no one's gonna pay out of pocket for uh, even if it's gonna help um their child and so it becomes a very much so a luxury item and so they were unable to get the traction that they needed to really continue and end up working okay because um the founder ended up buying my interests back from me but i still look at that company and i look at it you know the growth in autism and that's something really frustrating is that sometimes you could have a great uh product but the market and a lot of external factors are just not there to support it. It's really tough, the other, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, we'll yeah. come back to that. But yeah, I want to hear your, your, your thoughts. Yeah, it's very frustrating and it's heart-wrenching when that happens. Um, the other thing is, I think in BC, you know, I have a very unique pipeline of deals uh, because... I write a lot of trade periodicals. I'm writing a book right now. I speak quite often, you know, I teach. And so I get a lot of really great inbound deal flow from my network. And on top of that, you know, in our deal room, you know, we have hundreds of deals. And, you know, being a founder, you focus on one thing. Being a VC, you naturally go towards ADD because you're seeing so many pitch decks and you have to make these decisions And the decision is very binary. Do I need to spend 30 minutes with this founder or not? Does this fit my investment thesis? Will this get through, you know, an investment committee discussion or will be shot down? And so that, you know, you have to go through it very quickly. And it feels very, um, you know, removed almost Mm -hmm. from, you know, people are sharing their passion. They're sharing their ideas. And you're being very cold and making a very binary decision. And so that to me has been a a little bit of an adjustment because I I really like to get to know founders. And often I will stop the whole pitch deck business and just have a conversation with the founders, see if I can be helpful. And I guess I'm somewhat unique. I, I go against the grain in the regard that I try to get founders quick feedback saying, we're not the right fund for you. This these are the reasons, but maybe you should speak to X, Y, Z. They, they like these types of companies. Nice. And so I try to give them very quick feedback versus saying, let me go take it uh, back to an internal discussion. We'll get back Straight to you in a few along. weeks. Yeah. 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 That's good. That's good. I guess some of that probably comes from your time as a owner, operator, founder, and the empathy probably from your experience as well. And that makes Yeah, you'd be surprised. Better. 100%. 
120%. You'd be surprised at how many managers, fund managers have never been responsible for payroll before. Hmm. And so unless you're lying, you know, awake at 3 a.m. thinking about your 200 plus employees, their families, the food they got to put on the, on the table, you know, unless you've experienced that, it's very difficult to build that muscle. Yeah. And, and so that muscle memory comes back to me with everything that I look at. That's great. It's, it's refreshing to hear. Um, just on the point that you were mentioning earlier about like autism and all of these areas where it is disheartening when the product just isn't getting the traction because of external factors. Like you hear about a lot in like aged care and stuff like that, where who's going to pay for it? Is it going to be insurance? Is it a lot for the individual to pay for? Um, what kind of model, financial model are we looking at for this? And it's tough because they have the, there's a need there. There's a huge need and these, these technological innovations and products can help. And it just comes down to money at the end of the day. And that, I'm sure that's difficult, difficult pill to swallow for everyone involved. Absolutely. And that's where, you know, you have to look at it from the marketplace because yeah. What we found uh, with Q Innovations with the robotic ball is that countries like Denmark actually had the funds and wanted technology like that. And so we partnered with like Blue Ocean Robotics that introduced them to those uh, sort of single payer insurance systems where they felt the financial strain of having so many children, you know, that, that were that were undergoing very expensive therapy and not really showing progress and if you know about autism ch uh, children with autism respond much better to technology than they do to sort of even organic human interaction and so you know um so you really have to look at it from a global perspective you know when i was an investor in exobionics that went public and it was one of the first exoskeletons it made so much logical sense to me that like listen so a paraplegic will cost the system the healthcare system whatever that is you know four million dollars but if somebody wears an exo just standing up will get their blood circulating will, will cure digestive problems will make them psychologically healthier you know they'll sleep better the the prognosis will be so much better and an exoskeleton only costs between 60 and 100,000 but but in the US because there's insurance uh you know payer system it becomes very difficult unless you can get a DME code you know to to reimburse that and um it's one day it'll be there here it's not but once again in Europe, you can see that a lot of these technologies on the healthcare side are moving quicker, you know, because they're investing in technologies because they feel the the, the economic weight mm. of all those patients because it, 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 they have you know one healthcare system. So if they can reduce that, it helps out everybody. Yeah. Now I don't want this to be a public service announcement about <laughs> healthcare, but it's just showing that likewise, you know, if you look at um, you know, whether it's drones and you look at the regulations around drones, around robotics, around AI, you really have to look at the the, um, the policies involved. I mean, even autonomous vehicles in Arizona, which has a, a very sort of laissez-faire, you know, philosophy, has the probably the most successful, you know, pilots and tests of Waymo in the country, mm -hmm. um, even more than San Francisco because they are so pro innovation in, in that market and more hands off um, in a place like New York City. Uh, we have a lot of edge cases and we have a very hands on, you know, uh, municipal system that makes it very difficult to do stuff like that. Yeah. Same over here in California, <laughs> in Southern California, at least. Yeah. Um, let's, let's talk about your role. Uh, in a bit more detail, because obviously you partner at FS Venture Capital, you mentioned a number of things that you do, and I know that you invest in a number of different areas. So I'd love to understand a bit more about your primary responsibilities and then also some of the investment areas that you focus on and what excites you about those fields. Absolutely. So FF Venture Capital was founded in 2016 by John Frankel. Um, you know, it, it has six funds, 
Uh, we have a, a number of companies that are driving AAR over a hundred million dollars. You know, we uh, SoCure, which is uh, last raised capital about like a four and a half billion dollar uh, valuation. Wow. You know, Rescale, which is one of the leaders in high performance cloud computing. You know, we have a number of really high profile holdings in there. Uh, we also have some amazing companies in the automation sector. I named a few at the beginning of the program. Some others are like Mana Aerospace, which is doing real drone delivery in the UK and just opened up uh, an R&D center in Dallas and working with a very large fast food company doing a pilot there and bringing down the unit economics for food delivery. Uh, Zenith Aerospace, it does high altitude, um, you know, drones at uh, 60, 70,000 feet uh, with solar. Uh, Burrow, which is an agriculture, do, does autonomous towing um, around nurseries and, and orchards and, and vineyards. So we have an amazing portfolio of companies at, at a variety of different stages. We start our relationship at seed, and we will be the first institutional check. Um, you know, we'll write anywhere from 350 to 750 as an initial check. Uh, valuations plus, you know, tend to be plus or minus around uh, six and a half million dollars pre money. So it's about a 10 post uh, on the high side. And we will lead rounds and we'll continue to support in a punch above our weight up until a company's worth about $50 million. Um, as a partner there, a large amount of what I do is sourcing amazing companies and reaching out to amazing founders. A lot of that comes inbound through my network that I've built up over a considerable time. Uh, I have good relationships, you know, throughout, you know, uh, the United States, Israel, and Europe, and Asia. Um, whether that's, you know, at the ETH in Switzerland or the Technion in, in, in Haifa or, you know, Hyundai in, in Korea or, you know, Silicon Valley or throughout the East Coast, New York, you know, I'm here in New York. Um, is a hub and spoke model. You know, we go all the way up to the University of Waterloo, where ClearPath came out of, uh, at Magma, uh, which is the tier one auto supplier to Detroit, all the way down to the Tech Triangle by North Carolina, out to Pittsburgh, Austin, and Detroit. And so there's lots of points, Boston and Philadelphia, you know, feeding into that New York financial ecosystem. So, uh, you know, a lot of amazing companies come from, uh, our network and, and my personal network. And uh, I work with founders and helping them, you know, achieve the, their next milestone, whether that's funding, whether that's uh, sales. And so, you know, closing, uh, we are very exhaustive in our due diligence. Um, that could be good or bad. Uh, you know, we tend to take a, you know, a, some would say a long time, I would say a thoughtful period of uh, reaching investment conviction. But once we have that conviction, um, you know, we'll work through the legal, you know, and we'll go full in on the company. So, you know, uh, all the partners sit on boards, we're not passing it down to a principal, we're really hands on with the companies, you know, helping them on commercial development, helping them on the hiring, helping them on all the back office stuff. We built an accounting firm, you know, we help them on legal, we help, we, uh, we help them on, on growing internationally, um, on technical development, we bring all our resources and our outsourcing resources to bear, and, and really, you know, have a diverse amount of experiences around the table. John came from Goldman Sachs. Alex is a lawyer, and so we really try uh, try to be as helpful in coaching our founders to to really uh, move the ball forward. Um, and you know that's a business marriage, and that's not something that just lasts a year. It doesn't last till the next round. You know, I'm, uh, I have companies that have been in the portfolio for over a decade. You know, you know, and. And maybe they're getting tired and we look, we explore, you know, sort of private equity options with them and we, we help counsel them through that. So that's, you know, there's sourcing deals, there's managing the portfolio. And the last part is fundraising. I mean, ultimately, VCs are wealth managers, whether that's for institutions, whether that's for family offices, whether that's for high net worth. You know, we, we, we want to, you know, increase the value of their investment in us through deploying capital to great companies. And so, 
you know, a lot uh, of what keeps the engine going is fundraising. And so I also work on the fundraising side as a domain expert of automation and also trying to bring, bring together strategic partners. This takes many shapes and sizes. It's not only just about the next fund, but I, uh, I host um, an annual drones robotics AI summit uh, with the state of New York. Uh, it's very bespoke. And we've had people like Henry Christensen, who writes the robotics roadmap, speak. Um, we've had Wendy Ju, who's here at Cornell Tech, one of the real innovators of sort of the human robot connection. And she studies that, um, as well as our portfolio companies, as well as, you know, the CTO of New York City and and the, the head of the Empire State Development Corp, which is the investment arm of New York State uh, in the governor's office. And so, you know, we bring together founders, innovators, policymakers, you know, academics under one roof. And I think that very much so creates that flywheel of bringing together our LPs and bringing together our portfolio companies that makes it, you know, uh, a family, if you would, under that FF uh, umbrella. Nice. It's very multifaceted then. You seem very busy in a number of different areas, which is cool. Um, I was going to ask, you mentioned earlier about your teaching as well. So can you tell us about, in addition to obviously the venture capital work, your role as a professor and how you got involved in academia? Sure. Sure. I uh, teach at YU Sai Sim School of Business. Uh, I teach an MBA course called Entrepreneurship and the Management Change, just ended. Um, and it's really about building a startup from the ground up because in my heart, I'm a founder. Mm. And so it's really helping them from the customer discovery standpoint to putting together the team. You know, they'll do a business model canvas, executive summary, business plan, pitch deck. They'll pitch in front of, you know, real VCs. They'll get feedback from, uh, from the ecosystem, and so it's really to help them. And also, in parallel to that, they're reading lots of case studies, you know, um, from some of the you know the people that have influenced me and influenced the world, whether that's Steve Jobs, Sergey Brin, Larry Page, um, Steve Case, you know, Elon Musk, you know, uh, and others. And um, you know, it really it exposes uh, these students to just learning uh, from great leaders out there, as well as learning the mechanics of getting product market fit, going to market, driving sales, creating a customer facing company that could raise capital and scale. Um, as I said, you know, entrepreneurship could be a, a dry cleaner, you know, on, on 79th street. Uh, it could be, you know, a livery service. That's not what we're, what we're talking about. We're talking about the high, you know, uh, the high tech adoption curve uh, in sort of Jeffrey Moore speak. And so through eight weeks, seven modules, the, the course extends. Um, and it's a lot of fun. And it started out fairly small. Well, I think last year I had about 18 students. This year I have 35. Uh, I got oversubscribed. Uh, and, uh, you know, the provost asked me to increase my class size. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, I get good feedback. Yeah. That's cool. So, and how yeah. does your teaching experience influence your work, um, on the venture capital side or vice versa? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think it's just, you know, ultimately, you know, Business, technology, robots are about people mm. and it's about relationships. And um, it takes lots of people to make robots work. And um, if you can't foster great relationships, you know, whether that's between a student and a teacher, you know, a founder and an investor, employees, you know, uh, mentoring, you know, great associates, then the whole thing falls apart and it's a house of cards. And so I think by working with students, MBAs, and many of them work full time, who are looking to improve their career prospects, it's really inspirational of how hard they work 
and how dedicated they are to improving their lives and their quality of life. And so I think in the same way, founders want the same thing. And ultimately, we're doing this, you know, I said, VCs exist as wealth managers, but ultimately, we want to make the world a better place through these technologies. And that's what really helps me get up in the morning, knowing that what I'm investing in is like Save Robotics is creating more solar farms, which is getting us off oil and gas. Love that. Love that. When, when you're looking at new companies to invest in, um, it sounds like impact is one of the, the key factors here. But what other key factors do you look for when you're evaluating a startup or potential investments? Customers, customers, customers. Yeah, even at that very uh, early stage, a clear yeah. understanding of who their customer is or already traction. Yeah, I think, you know, there's been a, a lot of, I've been doing a lot of interviews, like you're interviewing me, with a lot of luminaries within the robotics industry for my book, A Startup Field Guy in the Age of Robots and Artificial Intelligence. And, you know, finding product market fit, you know, equals high utilization, reasonable payback, and reliability. But ultimately, the reason why you're deploying a technology is not because you love the technology, because that's the best solution the best tool in the toolbox that you can find to fix that problem. And too often, startups will fall in love with humanoids. Say, I want to do a humanoid startup. Well, what's that humanoid going to do? Uh, let me build the humanoid and then I'll figure it out. And they waste a lot of money and they waste a lot of their time and a lot of resources and the humanoid doesn't go anywhere. And so even in the early, I want that customer discovery to ring really clearly that they are solving a mission critical problem and it's validated by the marketplace. And it can even have some proof of concept revenue, you know, that says, we're going to pay money for this. If they meet our KPIs, then we're going to give them a purchase order. And that's exactly what Mick Mounts did after he left Webvan and created Kiva Systems which eventually got sold for $775 million. You know, so it was. that's what I'm investing in. <laughs> yeah. I, want to build, I want to build a billion-dollar company. And it has to start with people giving me money for my product. Yeah. Or I'm just playing t with toys. Fair, fair. So leading on from that, what advice do you have for entrepreneurs looking to get into robotics, hard tech, AI at the moment? Number one, don't get into it. <laughs> get into the problem solution business. Lovely. Get into yeah. being, you know, doing something mission critical. If hard tech, AI, robotics is, is the solution that solves that problem, then go full steam into that. But if, you know, virtual reality solves that problem, then go into VR. You know, if a, if a web marketplace would do it just as good, then do that. Yeah. So, you know, I really love frustrated entrepreneurs that come from the industry. And I mentioned McMounts. I've interviewed a little, uh, Rodney Brooks and Alan Grenier, and, and, and I just interviewed Daniel Theobald. You know, all these people who you know in the robotics space. But Mick is really interesting because Webvan was one of these spectacular dot-com bus stories, right? Mm -hmm. They did an $800 million IPO. And within, you know, 30 months, it was all the money was gone. Crazy. Shuttered. Yeah. You know, they built the, these beautiful distribution facilities, these beautiful, they had these trucks with a logo. They had national ad campaigns and they had, you know, you know, tens of thousands of customers, not millions of customers. And their product, you know, marketing group, you know, really didn't ask people what they wanted out of a grocery business. But more importantly, what Mick said is they were taping $50 bills on every box that went out. You have to understand, distribution um, systems back then were about moving cartons, mm -hmm. right? Slides and conveyance systems, they were about moving cartons. But here, they need to move a jar of tomato sauce. And he'd be like, well, will the shoot 
you know, can I put the a jar of tomato sauce down the chute? No, it it break. It's glass. You can't put it there. Um, can I put, you know, uh, on the slide, can I put this uh, bag of popcorn there? No, it's a bag. It, it's going to oh, get on the edges. It's, it's it'll break. Yeah. And there was nothing. They spent all this money on building this fancy distribution facility that that was very piecemeal, very specific to a very specific problem that didn't solve their problem. Hmm. And so it, he was trying to, after Webvan went bust, he's like, there has to be a better way. How about, how can robots help, you know, with opening up the cartons, with the pick and place? I mean, pick and pack, not pick and place. Robots help with pick and place, but with pick and pack. You open up the carton, you take a jar of tomato sauce, you take a bag of popcorn, you know, you take some flour, box it up, put a sticker, send it on a truck. How can you do that? And then he developed with, with Ralph and, and his other partner, Kiva Systems, that had robots that went underneath the shelving that brought the shelving to the picker. And eventually it, it connected to the best sellers. And they were doing it for diapers.com. They... They did it for Zappos. They did it for Walmart. They they built up a really great business, and uh, you know they were the first ones to do that. And uh, eventually, Amazon through the Diapers dot com acquisition and the Zappos app, uh, uh, acquisition became very aware, and they're like, "Listen, we need this, yeah. but we don't want our competitors to have it." And they eventually bought them for twenty five million dollars less than the IPO of uh, Webvan. And I give you that example. Because here it was a frustrated, you know, engineer who saw a real problem, you know, uh, in, in 1999, 2000, saw it go bust and said there must be a better way. The best solution is a robot, a mobile robot. Okay, let's do that. And then he, he went in and sold it. He did a pilot. He, t he tied the KPIs of the pilot, you know, uh, contract an agreement. So it would automatically go into a purchase order. It's like, well, what do you want this to do? How many units do you want this to do? And, and if it does X, Y, and Z, will you buy it? Okay, let's do it. And he built a very successful business that way. That's great. That's what I want to invest in. And that's why I'm saying, don't get attracted to robots and AI, get attracted to the problem. Love that. That's a great example. I hadn't even heard that story before. I didn't realize that they were doing it on both the diapers.com side and the Zappos side. That's really cool. Um, I've always loved those dots connecting for me. So thank you. <laughs> um, any other, it sounds like that's a major pitfall that people would or could fall into getting into like the new shiny thing, right? AI, humanoids, that's like all the hype and rage right now. Any other pitfalls that um, startups or even founders should try and avoid from your perspective? Wow, there's a lot of those. <laughs> um, I mean, first off, going back to people, ultimately, you got to build a culture and you got to build a team mm -hmm. and you got to motivate your team. And you can't just get attracted to titles. You know, like I meet people all the time. They're like, I'm the CEO of XYZ company. I'm like, okay. You know, like you just can't throw the ego you know, with the amigos, you know, just focus on the business you're solving and be a visionary founder. You got to motivate people out there. The purpose of a CEO is to create vision that everyone could subscribe to. And so you really want to create and impart that vision, whether that's to investors, to, to talent, to future talent, to partners, to customers, you want everybody to feel that vision and excitement for the brand. Um, and I think too often they just put their heads bogged down in solving, you know, uh, a fire here and a fire there. And they're just, you know, when you say they can't see the forest from the trees, it's really true. They're just, they're just going from one tree to the other yeah. without seeing the big picture. And it's very important, excuse me, as a founder to see the big, the big picture. And, um, and to really solve the uh, for that, and then to be able to delegate. So you need to hire people smarter than yourself and surround yourself with great people as well. Yeah. You can't just take it all on yourself. And so uh, many times a founder will, you know, will be like Midas. No one, no one does it better than me. <laughs> you know, like they got to, they got to really inspire people 
to be collaborators. And you don't want that to turn into a fiefdom where people are competing each, against each other. Everyone has to be, again, tied to that vision. So culture is critical Love and appreciating, appreciating culture. And as somebody who is all about culture and team, yeah. you know, that rings very true. I think find, finding that product market fit, you have to understand something that's unique in robotics, right? Number one, you're building trust and shit got to work. If it's not reliable and it's going to go down, then they're not going to trust you, you know, with their crown jewels, whether that's the manufacturing, the, the, the latest products, whether that's moving goods that people are buying for in logistics, whether that's in a healthcare setting. So you really got to have a, build a very reliable system that, that, that people can, you know, build trust and value and take risks of putting it in the organization and influencing others in the organization, other business units to adopt. Now, you also got to realize that robots will go awry. So you got to figure out what, how are you going to solve for those edge cases? You know, um, Daniel Theobald of Vecna, you know, he would have like the robot call up Vecna if there was something that he didn't understand. So, and a person would come in and be able to solve for those edge cases there. You know, uh, Rodney Brooks believes in having the robot have human agency. So that, that if the robot is in the way of something, a human can, you know, the, uh, robust AI, they have a handle, the handle senses the human and it can override the system and take it out of the way. Mm -hmm. For example, if you had a robot going uh, in a hospital and there's a nurse with a gurney of someone having a cardiac arrest, the robot's blocking the way, people are really going to hate that robot, right? right. It leads to a death. So you need to have that human uh, agency in, in the equation. Nice. Um, you know, in uh, Diligent Robotics, uh, Andrea Thomas, the founder of Diligence Robotics, has the, the robot has a head and, it, and the eyes light up like hearts. And it makes people feel very comfortable when it's running down the hospital. It doesn't really, doesn't there's no need, need for the head. Yeah. It, it just, to make people uh, aware that it's doing a job. It's, it's bearing, you know, sheets and towels around the hospital. But it's a pleasant thing. You don't have to be scared of it. And it's going to do the job. And it, mm -hmm. it, it knows you're there. Um, so I think you really got to, it really has to be reliable to build those trusts. And those are some examples of where uh, of they do that. Yeah. It needs high utilization. A robot collecting dust is not going to get you another robot sale. It, it, you know, so it really needs high utilization. If robots are not being utilized, if the problem you're solving is a one hour a day problem, then it's pointless to do it because like no one's going to buy a robot that way. It's just a toy. You know, it's sort of like, um, uh, Abo, the uh, robotic dog from Sony. You know, once it came out of the box and you saw it do its tricks, it's going to be a toy in the closet. Yeah. So it really needs high utilization. Um, and then, you know, it can't be this expensive thing that's completely like, you know, unreasonable. You can say, well, you know, so and so company or a person, you know, can afford. No, it has to fit into the wallet. I don't know how many consumer robot companies I've seen. And I was in the consumer space with Robot Galaxy. And I don't really invest in it today, but where it was like a thousand dollars for the robot, I'm like, or even five hundred dollars for the robot. I'm like, five hundred dollars? That's like six months worth of groceries in America. Yeah. Are you kidding me? Like, who's going to buy that? Some people in Manhattan will buy it, and some people in Beverly Hills will buy it. But that's not a business. That's not a billion dollar yeah. business. You know, as investors, we want to invest in billion dollar businesses. So. um you know, I think that if if you have those ingredients, then you have a value proposition that 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 that, that people can get get behind. Um, Good. There's there's other pitfalls. I think the uh, the other thing is on the business model, hmm. um, and and also on the partnership model. I think that um, too often founders' head will spin from advice from investors, advice from you know third parties, from partners, from system integrators, from, they got to, they got to sell how the, how the customer wants to buy. Forget about what the investors say. Because every investor would be like, I want you to do a RAS model, robot as a service. Well, if you go into manufacturing with a RAS model, 
you're going to find the door on the other side really quickly because they don't want to buy a RAS model. They want the depreciation of an equipment purchase. They're like, why am I going to pay you monthly? Why are you going to get the benefit of the depreciation that I should be taking on my books? But in logistics, it will work. A farm, it doesn't work. That's not how they buy equipment. They want it on a lease rental basis. In construction, they want a rent to own. Follow the business model of your customers. Develop a customer-focused business. Not an investor-focused business, not a tech-focused business, but a customer-focused business. And lastly, a big pitfall is creating partnerships too early. You know, like a dealership. Well, you got one product. What is a dealer going to sell? Uh, you know, like they don't need to know how to handle one uh, one product. But if you once you have you know significant sales and you're going into new markets like Australia, Japan, then a dealer a dealer might make sense or a value added reseller or a channel partner. But don't do that day one because it'll just fail. Interesting trying to jump the gun there to, to more of a mature state when you put one product. That's, that's an interesting one. Uh, you, you mentioned culture and team, which obviously I'm a big mm. proponent for something that I, I do every day. How important from your side is that when you're looking at that seed stage of funding, like how, how mature or fleshed out of a team do you want or culture do you want before you write a check? That's mission critical for investors at the early stage. The difference between early stage and later stage is psychological. You want, you're investing in, you know, the captain that's going to write the ship. And so it really goes in this order, people, product, and plan. It's really that simple. Nice. Because if you don't have a relationship with, that, with, with the team that you're investing in, if you think they're arrogant, if you think they're rigid, um, then and they, and that's when they're putting their hand out for money, it's only going to get worse after you invest. We want to see coachable founders. We want to see founders that listen. Not to say we don't want to see passionate founders who, who, who have strong beliefs in what they're doing, but we want them to listen. And even if what we're saying is not correct, we want them to listen and tell us why we're not correct, not in a know-it-all fashion, but in a very logical and, and clear, succinct um, statement. Ultimately, you want people that are going to, once again, inspire others to join uh, the mission because you, you, you want you know, talent to be like a honey hive, you know, attracting all the bees there. And in the tech space, talent is very scarce, especially, you know, rock stars. You know, um, Reed Hastings, uh, and I'm sure you read No Rules Rules because it's all about culture, you know, uh, would say that they, you know, were not a family. They were, they were a professional sports team. And they would pay their, um, you know, at Netflix, their employees sports salaries. They would overpay what the market is because they'd rather have one, you know, uh, you know, one Brunson on the team, you know, Jalen Brunson, than a whole bunch of people playing for the G league. And so, um, I don't know how much, you know, basketball it doesn't, <laughs> not as much, but I kind of get, I get that. Analogy. <laughs> but, but you want, you, you, you really want, you know, a Steph Curry yeah. put it in, modern sort of like uh, less <laughs> right <laughs> okay then, then somebody who who's who didn't make the high school basketball team right. but can dribble a ball and so they'd rather have rock stars than mediocre players and so that is really critical and that all starts you know fish rots from the head that all starts from the top of who can attract that great talent who can be really coachable who listens to advice who, who understands and has the domain expertise, who listens to their customers, you know, who's really going to spend wisely because it, it's funny because founders, you know, will be so scarce with their money and then they get like a million and a half dollars and they don't realize how fast it will go. And mm. you really want someone to be like, oh, we need this to last as long as possible, you know. So that's number one. Number two is product. 
the product really has to be defensible. It has to be mission critical. It, it you know, the IP needs a, a mode around it, you know, and then the plan is like, how are they going to build this into a billion dollar business? Nice. Um, there's other things like valuation and so forth, but going back to your original question, team, people is the most important thing. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I, I love the way that you put that. Um, let's talk about the, the future now. What are some of the most exciting trends that you're seeing in robotics and hard tech today? Yeah, so there's a lot of excitement for humanoids out there. Um, and I'm humanoid cynical and humanoid curious at the same time. Uh, I'm cynical because, you know, going back to high utilization, you know, humanoids move kind of slowly, so they collect some dust. You know, reliability, you can go to YouTube and see all the humanoid blooper reels out there. You know, uh, and payback, they're pretty expensive. And uh, I don't know if they're the best thing to move boxes around a warehouse or, you know, car parts. But at the same time, they could be a game changer uh, for everything because the world is built for humans. And, uh, you know, there's uh, eight plus billion of us out there and the factories, uh, the tables, the, you know, the, uh, everything we, we, we interact with is built for humans. So a humanoid can, you know, you don't have to rip and replace, put down rails. A humanoid can go right onto a floor and really make a change. Mm. And it's really, you know, exciting now because we have a number of great companies in that space. Regardless of whether we're going to have humanoids on the street or in our factories, you know, 10 years from now, all the technologies that will go into building the, the current uh, wave of humanoids will filter down to create some great, you know, other solutions like, you know, a hand, you know, a lead article I think in New York Times today is about AI and a prosthetic limb about a robotic hand. And so that can also be used for gripping my, you know, my glass right here as well. So um, I think that there's some really great things on the end effector side, on the on the vision side, on the force sensing side, uh, uh, on the path planning side, on all on the you know bipedal you know balancing side and the actuation side, you know, and the gearing and so forth like that. So there's a lot of excitement, and and in order to build a humanoid, we, we have foundational technologies that are really exciting today. Probably um, the one that has gotten the most hype, rightfully so, is Gen AI. And I think, you know, obviously, OpenAI and Claude and, and all the others that, are, that the consumers are interfacing with is really exciting. Um, really helps my students, you know, get their homework done. But um, I, I think that... Uh, where it gets, you know, really interesting is well, what happens when you can build it for niche enterprises. Like, for example, manufacturers are very proprietary by their products. But if they could take all their data on their products and that can create a, a vision library so you could, you could, you know, deploy a cobot very readily that it understands everything there on, on the entire product line that they're producing and the proprietary products there, you know, uh, or it could lead to better product development of, uh, of what they're doing, whether that's for new cars or appliances or, or systems, uh, whether that's for financial services, you know, taking once again, that proprietary corpus of information and utilizing that. Um, and then, you know, and like for healthcare and there's all, we can talk all day about it. I also think, and this was also a, the lead article in the journal today, was about how AI companies are investing in nuclear power plants. And so I think that, that the, the demand for these technologies that require lots of energy, including autonomous vehicles, um, including you know crypto and, and AI, will also make us more creative of how we produce you know energy. Um, and it'll, it, it won't be just like, well, you know, this year we're going to do solar and next year we're going to do wind and then we're going to go back to fossil fuels and what have you. It, it'll be a much more all-encompassing one where we'll create small nuclear reactors. You know, we, we could, you know, there, there's lots of interesting, um, you know, technologies, you know, that, that we're just learning about, you know, and tapping into the Earth's crust and what have you. Yeah. So it, 
I think, you know, these things are not just one or the one or two isolated things. It's part of an ecosystem. Amazing. Yeah, it's, 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 I, I know I said it earlier, but it's such an interesting time and all the problems that we need to overcome. I think energy is such a huge one because I was having a conversation just about Gen AI the other day, and I didn't realize how much energy it takes, you know, if you do like a Google search to get up one word to get what the same word from a, an LLM is like 100 times the energy that it takes from just a general search engine. I'm like, wow, that's crazy. But we don't think about that, right? And the ripple effects and the adoption and stuff like that. So you've got to get more creative. And there's so many other problems and challenges that we need to overcome to in parallel to the advancement of the tech, right? Yeah. And I would say lastly, defense innovation is an interesting thing, not for warfare but what would come out of warfare unfortunately we have a lot of global conflicts today mm -hmm. but from in the same way post-war ii with endover bush and his document of endless frontier which created the partnership between the government research and academia and the private sector i think you're going to see a renaissance of these technologies post all these conflicts interesting okay yeah it's definitely been a hot space for innovation and, and uh, investment uh, over the last few years. So I'm sure that's going to continue. Okay. Well, look, before we wrap up, um, are there any other final thoughts or, I mean, you've given so much advice already, so I know our listeners are going to get so much value from this, or is there anything else that you want to share for people that are passionate about the space? Yeah, I think, you know, and maybe because I'm writing it about this chapter right now, which is about called revving up your engines, which is about raising capital, you know, uh, and we didn't really touch on it is, is that you really have to think about who your partners are. If you're ready for venture capital, you know, that, that is a relationship that definitely comes with strings, you know, it, it comes with expectations. Um, and not all capital partners are the same. Um, you know, VC, as I said, ultimately are wealth managers. But corporate VC are about strategic fit uh, with their business units. You know, um, accelerators, you know, sometimes they're backed by, you know, um, different organizations or governments. And, and, and government could be a great partner, like the SBAR system, the DARPA system. You know, so there's uh, lots of ways to raise capital. You know, obviously, there's your friends and family to ranging from your university. And um, I think you really got to think very thoughtfully about who you want as partners, in, especially in the early stage. And you also have to be mindful as a founder that those are your partners. And just because you reach the next rung on the ladder in raising your next rounds, you're going to forget about them and now you're going to focus on on the new you know the new shiny object yeah because that that's only going to hurt you long term because you're doing a startup today you know a number of years from now you're going to be on to your next startup you're going to go back to those original people and be like hey you forgot all about us i haven't yeah. heard from you in 10 years you know so you really have to be respectful of those capital partners and and really think through you know i don't know how many times i get emails uh, for companies that we don't invest in. We don't invest in healthcare. I get a ton of healthcare companies. We don't invest in consumer. I get a ton of consumer. All it does is take 10 seconds on our website to figure that out. So really do your diligence on who you want as your partners and where the alignment is. And then you can get the most out of that. Because if you call everybody, nobody's going to want to touch you. Yeah. So really be selective just as they're being selective with you. That's great advice. Thank you. Um, so finally, where can the listeners follow you or interact with you, your work, FF Venture Capital, and also keep an eye out on your book when that releases? Yeah, no pressure there. No uh, pressure. I just delayed my deadline. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need um, a date. Just <laughs> yeah. 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 Hopefully by the end of the summer, the book will be done. Yeah, let's go through a couple edits and so forth like that. But um CRC Press being published, uh, who also does the Informa AI Summit. So I imagine they'd be promoting it at the AI Summits. Um, you can reach me on LinkedIn, Oliver Mitchell. Uh, 
uh, FF Venture Capital, you know, uh, you can reach me that way. Um, I also have a blog. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, I was always known as the robot guy. Uh, then my marketing department created a blog for me. And they gave me a promotion. I became the robot rabbi. Uh, <laughs> they know I'm Jewish. And so, um, you know, you can you go to robotrabbi.com. You can see all my articles. Right now, I'm a little bit on writing sabbatical from trade periodicals because I'm focusing on the book. But um, all my contact stuff's there as well. Perfect. Well, look, thanks again for joining us and sharing so much of your wisdom. I know that everyone's going to get a lot from this episode. And I uh, hope to speak to you soon. Thank you, Greg. Uh, have a great day. I really, this was a lot of fun. Appreciate that. Thanks, Oliver.